My name is Felicia Day and I am a web video creator. I act and I produce and I write in a show called The Guild. That was my first web series and subsequently I branched out into a couple other series. Um, I got here because I, I was uh, bored of the way that my life had been going just as an actor in Hollywood. I always made quite a good living and worked constantly in uh, TV and commercials and movies, but I was, uh, you know, there are ways that, that you get pigeonholed and you don't really get to work as much as you want to on a regular basis sometimes. So I decided to have a World of Warcraft addiction and that um, took over my life for like a year and I got rid of that and I decided to create something and uh, by writing and they always say write what you know. So I wrote a half hour TV pilot um, based on my World of Warcraft addiction, like a comedy with a set of characters that I thought were funny and who I'd associated with people like that online. And um, instead of making it as a TV show, which would never have happened because it's so specific, uh, I met my co-producer Kim Evie and um, she suggested we do it for the web and start parceling up the script into small bite-sized pieces. So the guild started off as a pilot for, uh, for a 30 minute show. Yes, I wrote it initially as a 30, uh, you know, a 30 minute half hour pilot about a group of online gamers who um, interact online and offline. And um, it was the first thing I ever wrote really besides sketch comedy. And um, it was, uh, you know, it was quite a learning curve, but I was really proud of it. And I put everything I had into it. And people who were moderately geeky would say, this is really, really, really funny. And then people who were in the mainstream, Hollywood, sort of agents and development executives and producers, they were, they would say, I don't understand what's going on here. <laughs> they didn't understand the gaming terminology or, the, and they said, basically give it up and do a spec script on an existing show because that, that way you'll be able to break in. Uh, don't waste your time with this because it's way too specific. And I was sad because I really thought it was funny and it was really good. And my producer, Kim Evie, like I said, read it and she had been doing some viral uh, videos on YouTube for a while with her husband. And she said, this is perfect for the web because this is where the people you're talking about are. And that's when we just sat down and decided to do it. No filmmaking training at all. So did you want to be a TV writer or was it just that this was a specific show that you wanted to create? When people suggested that I do a spec script for television and mainstream um, sort of uh, movies and TV, I was not interested at all because I, um, I know how writers get treated in Hollywood. <laughs> and uh, their creative process really is, you know, it's considered sort of um, a mass-produced commodity oftentimes. And that wasn't really interesting to me as a creator. Um, I didn't want to try to pander to everybody. I didn't want to try to marginalize what I, I wanted to say, the stories I wanted to tell, the characters I wanted to create. Um, and really, at the time, there weren't a lot of avenues to be able to retain that. Um, I mean, I guess you could make a film festival film or a short, but there's a very specific genre that is embraced in that sort of world and not necessarily comedy or, sp or like spoofy comedy. So uh, there weren't really a lot of ways to get that story out there. Um, and thank goodness, you know, my... Uh, Kim was used to the internet and she she made me feel brave enough to be able to try something that I'd never done before which was extremely scary the decision to make something and not really know how to do it at all was at the same time ter terrifying and thrilling was she your friend beforehand she was actually my f only writing teacher that I've ever had she taught a sketch writing class I took a three-month sketch writing class and that's the only writing training I've ever had and uh, she a year later we just met for lunch randomly and that's how we kind of reacquainted ourselves so she had been producing for the web previously? Kim had had a, a couple of series. Uh, the one at the time was Gorgeous Tiny Chicken Machine Show. And she did, it was a uh, small vignettes about like a spoofing Japanese um, talk shows. And she dressed as this uh, sort of uh, Japanese school girlish girl, uh, Kiko. And she had this crazy talk show and people would come in and be very confused about it. And it, so it was spawned from a, a sketch shit that she wrote for Acme Comedy Theater, and that's where I met her by taking a class. Um, so the web before the Guild, what, what were webisodes like at the time that you were discussing making this? For the I mean, web series before I made the Guild uh, were definitely present. I don't mean to claim the title of the first web series. There were some like Z Frank, and um, there were a couple of other, like the Bergs, um, a couple of other web series that were moderately known. It wasn't 
something that people really were doing at all on a widespread basis. Um, it was certainly a nascent uh, format. Uh, YouTube really was even nation at the time. I mean, basically, it was maybe some viral videos, a couple, but most people didn't watch video on the web just because four years ago, I mean, it's amazing the infrastructure has changed. People, how many more people watch video and stream video and have the capability to do all that at a, t at a, a pace that you can actually buffer everything <laughs> at once. So um, it certainly wasn't something that was commonly done now, uh, like now. And uh, and I don't know, it just seemed like a, a something to leap into that we, <laughs> we just, it was a leap of faith. So do you think, <clears throat> how would it be different if you were launching the guild today? If I were to launch the guild today, it would be a much uh, more saturated field with web series. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd, you know, we've invented a lot of things along the way. Um, when I joined Twitter and I made a Facebook fan page and I, you know, did WordPress install myself and I did Photoshop myself to be able to make the graphics that look pretty, you know, the opening of our... Um, you know, on our website and the opening of our episodes. Like, those are all things that we invented, you know. I mean, I'm not saying we invented. Let me back up because we looked at the tools that we had online and we, and which were in the beginning stages. I was on Twitter very, very, very early. I was probably, you know, I brought the entertainment there in, in the early stages. It was mostly tech early adopters who did it. So we just looked at the tools that we had online and we said, well, what can we use to, um, you know, get in touch with our audience on a more regular basis. So, I mean, now it's so fully developed, like people know what to do. They know how to make a Facebook fan page, they know how to make a Twitter, they know how to make, craft web seri websites that web series are, um, make them appealing. And uh, it was very early on. Uh, I'm not saying that we were the first, but we were certainly one of the first. And do you think that was important for? I think that the social media things that we did um, early on in the show absolutely uh, hinge on the success of the show. I mean, we our show the first season was completely funded by fans after the first two episodes. And the only reason we did that was that somebody at a meeting said, oh, we're not really funding web series, but maybe maybe you could put up a, a PayPal button. And we were like, I don't know if anybody pay for this, but why not? So I made a website, I got a WordPress install, I learned PHP really badly, <laughs> and then I put the PayPal button up. and um, And people actually donated which was insane to us. And by the end of the first season, we had so many people, I just shut it down because I felt um, like any more credits would look tacky and I didn't want to lie to anybody because we, you know, we might not have done, you know, 11th episode. So it became overwhelming um, releasing the show. And we only released them once a month, which is a little bit unusual for web series, but I think it was key to um, the success because it let it grow and word of mouth spread between episodes. And so how did you settle on, <coughs> excuse me, the format of it? The, I guess the length is, it kind of fluctuates in the beginning, mm -hmm. the length of each episode, and then they become longer. Um, but the first season was based on that pilot script. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? The first season was based on the, the I think, 42-page pilot script that I wrote. And we just started um, instinctively cutting them up into pieces that seemed um, friendly to the web. And that at that time, I think everybody said anything over three minutes nobody would watch. But... Um, and I think episode one is like three minutes long, or maybe it's under right under four, but it's 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 extremely short. I think it's the shortest episode we ever made, and that was because everybody told us, "Oh, you can't have it very very long," which I think is very true, especially for our first episode. The shorter, the better. Um, but as we evolved, we just decided, "Hey, the story's good enough. I think we can support this. We don't need to just cut out whole swaths of the episode just because somebody has this arbitrary decision about how long a web series." Uh, episode should be so we you know we do fluctuate which I think is uh, amazing I know that you know when you, you do TV they tend to get in post and they stretch out moments that don't necessarily need to be stretched out or they shrink things that don't necessarily need to be shrunk because of the time constraints and that's what's great about making something for the web for streaming there isn't a rule you don't have programming coming on right afterwards to uh, cut you off I mean, when you put together the website when you put together um the PayPal, that you're all personally doing that yourself, or the team is doing that stuff? Um, when I say that I did the PHP and put the website together and put the PayPal up and boxed over 2,000 DVDs, 
ourselves, that's two women, me and Kim. <laughs> uh, a couple times we had volunteers come and help us because we had so many customs forms to fill out for the DVDs. Um, that was a free volunteer that we just found who liked the show. But um, even today, like we don't have a staff. We have an assistant sometimes we hire. And we have somebody who helps us with social um, uh, interaction, community interaction. But uh, that has taken three years to get to those point, And those are very part-time people who only occasionally come in. Um, so it is still me and Kim doing everything. And when I say everything, it's, you know, learning PowerPoint, learning Excel, um, learning how to uh, compress video properly, doing Final Cut when the editor wasn't available to do, uh, um, you know, some of the editing. I mean, it, it was absolutely a situation where every step of the way we saw a need and we saw a way to make our episodes better and reach our audience better and we didn't have any money to hire people to do it so we just learned how to do it <laughs> i mean we're never we're experts you know it's kind of like the jack of all trades master of none but um that's what we've cobbled together do you think that level of kind of diy authenticity was really important to the culture of the guild when it was introduced i think that kind of diy culture was definitely um very important because it um, it sort of branded the show with my face because I became the face of the show and the driving impulse and it personalized the show in a way that I think made it that much more successful um, I think on the web the more personality driven you are the better because you're in a sea of products and graphics and if you can really connect on a human to human basis which I think you can do in an amazing way on the internet um, you, you just make it much more um, uh, people are rooting for you more in a sense and people knew that we were just shooting in our garage and people uh, All our actors work for free for the whole first year. We just paid with our donations for uh, cameras and and uh, rentals and, and feeding people so um, People knew that at the end of the day that DVD was going to pay the actors for a whole free year and I think that goodwill aspect um, sort of infused the show with a sort of um, you know go get them attitude with the public and it, it just is uh it's very heartening to know that people would donate five dollars from indonesia to help us make that show keep going and it was just it, it's so precious and something that i'll always be the most proud of uh, talk to me about the the engagement with the audience and how important that was our engagement with our audience is absolutely key to where we are if we had just put videos on youtube and never um publicized them in any way like it would just go down like a lot of web series do because um, that's 90% of the work is reaching the audience that will like your show and maintaining them and keeping them coming back in a way that's not intrusive or feels fake or forced and that's you know when we saw tools I'm, I've just always been kind of a geek and I love early adoption and I love tech and I love tools and I love social tools and this was when t Twitter had just started that I joined and I didn't know exactly what was going on but I knew that some tech people I admired were on there and uh, and I said well maybe you know I could tell 40 people at once how the show and that'll save me uh, from my email blast I mean literally those are the things that that uh, kind of kept the show going and going to every single blog um, that featured our show and linked to it and thanking them personally I still do that on a semi-regular basis because I know that there are so many things to choose from on the internet. Um, you want to, you know, it's it's very heartening that somebody would get behind your show no matter who we're distributing through. So uh, I think, you know, little touches like that, the humanity of it, um, seeing that it's just really literally two women doing this, uh, I think went so, so far in keeping the integrity of the show. And I think integrity is very important on the web. Is it difficult as, it, as the audience gets bigger to maintain that? It's definitely harder uh, the bigger the show gets, um, but like I said, when we um, when we saw that some of our social interaction was um, on the wane because I was doing my own personal stuff, uh, and, and then I was also doing all the stuff for the show and answering all the email and um, making sure that all the graphics were updated and everybody was being, you know, the comments were being called on YouTube. Um, we realized that we needed help. So sometimes we would have an intern come in and once a month just clean out the inbox. And then we gradually built to having somebody, um, a guy named Brian, who's a, who was a friend of Kim's, help us out and sort of um, make sure that that our Twitter and our Facebook is updated with everything and I'll, I'll send him stuff to sort of feed through there. Um, it definitely is a little bit more challenging but like I said I spend the time every week and every day on my own personal social media and uh, and the show's social media and it's I mean social media is such an awkward word it, it feels like you're trying to exploit somebody it's really just updating people on um, what's happening 
in an organic way and that's really really important to us to, to keep that because that's what separates us from TV and movies that personalization that people could feel that they know us and they can approach us on the street and say hi I really like your show rather than being intimidated and just stare or tweet I just saw so and so go by I mean that sort of um, spirit is is what I think you have to look at when you make a web series to make it successful because you're never going to compete with TV on the budgets and the glamour that they have uh, is there a particular you know, tech solution that really helped you solve a problem you were facing? It, you mentioned Twitter a lot. Is that the one that was most important? I think Twitter was definitely the biggest key um, for me because it, the way that it's constructed, it was easy to broadcast and, and at the same time kept me engaged personally because you can winnow uh, the the noise down. Like you don't have to follow 4,000 people because that would just take the quality of use for me as a person out. Um, I mean, I treat it like an I am for the world, my, my own personal t Twitter, um, because if I see a funny video, I want to share it with as many, you know, my personal I am list, which just happens to be almost 2 million people. Um, but it, uh, yes, absolutely, Twitter is definitely the way that it's constructed um, lent itself um, the best. Also, you know, email lists were very key in, in the beginning, and the website, RSSing, and um, I mean, it's it's been one person at a time. I mean, we've been here for four years. We have a huge fan base, but it was fought for in a way that um, it was important to me that everybody enjoyed the show and I could get as many people who might like the show involved as possible. So uh, it was kind of a personal quest. I'm a little obsessive <laughs> uh, over it, but I know that um, you know that kind of personalization goes a, a long way, and I enjoy it. So it's definitely the perfect fit. I, I just embraced whatever technology I had, and I would just. Uh, and would attach the show to it and myself. It sounds like, um, you know, when, when you give the short story of how the guild became humongous, it's just like you decided to do the guild one day and then the next day it was like millions of people. But like what mm -hmm. were, was there like one or a couple of like specific obstacles where you just thought you were fucked and you had to like figure out like a clever solution that saved the day or something like that and made it better? Every single step of the way, it's been a challenge. I mean, it's not easy. It's not just because I'm a girl on the internet that somehow this has instantly become uh, popular and I think that's kind of a perception that is so inaccurate because um, it's such hard work every single day I mean I write everything and I co-produce it so for those first guild episodes I would drive out to Fremont and because I saw something on a Craigslist that somebody put some electronics <laughs> on the on their porch and like we don't have anybody but me and Kim and the director are doing anything I would be putting the posters on the background. And that, still to this day, like, it'd be like, can you just go pick up a prop? Okay. So um, it has none of the barriers of traditional television. Um, and, you know, yes, along the way, things definitely um, were challenging, trying to find locations at any price that we could afford, which was almost zero. Um, uh, getting cast members uh, to, to keep... Um, you know the scheduling to to be able to shoot uh, because we could never be a priority over regular TV and film because of the rates that we paid. You know, I mean, on and on and on. Um, being able to find a deal for the show that I felt wasn't going to um, put it into the pit of of uh, you know um, ownership that really wouldn't service the show any better or it would do actually do much worse for the show and the fans. So I um, mean, every single step of the way is a challenge. Um, keeping you know reaching our, f our fourth season and still having people engaged and interested and be able to get press on the show and bloggers to feature it. Like, it's all very, very, very difficult. It's an uphill battle all the way and we've never paid for advertising ever. I mean, the only thing we've paid for it, like on that scale would be the Comic-Con booth, which we staff ourselves. <laughs> I mean, we get there on Wednesday and we push the bo boxes in and we unload it and we try to put those crates together. It was definitely, that was one of the mo more unpleasant things. <laughs> that and taxes. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned the deal, is it the Microsoft deal? Yes. And if you were getting money from the audience via PayPal, well, tell me a little bit about the decision to, to get a deal rather than, you know, generate the money through PayPal. <clears throat> and if you needed to have a deal in order to, to continue the show. After we finished season one, based on fan donations, we did 10 episodes for the season, and we realized we absolutely couldn't sustain it any farther. I mean, we had the ca all the cast members working for free for over a year, um, and the donations were fantastic, and some people would donate, you know, $100 or $200, I think was our, uh, the big one. I was, I had to check to make sure he did <laughs> put, the, put the decimal in the right place. Um, 
and we, we just couldn't do it. We couldn't um, keep our cast together and make them, you know, stay as invested saying, hey, let's go another year without working. Um, I mean, without being able to pay you. So we knew we needed a deal and we had many, many offers because we, by the end of the season, we had meet, reached millions and millions and millions of YouTube views. But um, really there was no deal in the traditional sense that um, didn't come and take all the creative rights and give us almost no money for the episodes and kind of deprive us of the control that we had. Because really, our sort of um, ingenuity, is that how you, <laughs> um, uh, It was really our ingenuity that um, got the show to where it was and there was nobody out there who was offering to take the show from us that was doing it better than us. So there was really no incentive. Like we were absolutely prepared to shoot a second season or at least start it on our own money that will be kept from the DVD sales. But uh, thank goodness Microsoft came in and said that we would, you know, we would love to help you make the show. It fits our um, demographic perfectly for Xbox. It will expand your audience to millions of new people and we don't need to own it. And it was like a dream come true, really. And um, we, t we were offered a lot of really interesting deals by um, traditional networks and really interesting producers. But at the end of the day, um, nobody but Microsoft was really the one who came in and said, we're, we'll take what you do, we'll let you do what you're doing, and we'll take you to another level because we'll, we'll introduce millions of new people to your show. And that's exactly what happened. So we took a big leap forward when we made that deal. And it was just us being able to hold out and say, no, these are the parameters we'll work under. And if we don't get that deal, we'll do it our own. That was the power that gave us um, the opportunity to, to take the show to, you know, its fifth season now. Um, tell me a little bit about being a female entrepreneur. It seems like you you mentioned earlier, or is there a vibe that people are like, well, you're a pretty girl, and that's why this is successful, and it has nothing to do with your hard work? Or I think that, um, you know, I don't want to say on a general basis that people look at me as a woman and say, oh, the reason why you're successful is that you're a girl who's kind of a, a geek on the internet. Or, um, I mean, I, I definitely think there are those voices out there, but there are voices for everything on the internet. Um, I do think that um, maybe there is um, sort of a, an an attitude that maybe if I wasn't a, uh, if I wasn't a woman, if I was a guy, that maybe we wouldn't get as much coverage. and. I mean, how can I, I can't argue with that. I can't say one way or another. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not psychic or anything. I do um, think that my experience with uh, traditional media, like TV and, and movies, um, definitely gave me a leg up in just being able to film make on a, on a very low budget and make that really good. And I think being organically, um, you know, raised on the internet and being homeschooled, I don't, I never had the perception of women not being, uh, you know, sort of, forward really bold and forward thinking and just being able to see an opportunity and take it. I think girls are kind of uh, hampered when they're growing up and uh, especially in their teen years that um, they're not they're not pushed to be as hungry and ambitious and it might seem unattractive in a woman. So I guess I mean if anything that would be um, sort of the challenge that uh, women sort of fight this sort of stereotype that you have to be beautiful uh, but if you're you know if you're pretty then obviously that's the only reason you got where you are but if you dress really down you might not get as much tension I mean it's very it's a double-edged sword for women and if you're too uh, ambitious and too uh, bold then you're just um, unpleasant and bitchy <laughs> and overbearing uh, I'm sorry I don't know if I can say that but uh, I think there is it's a trap that women fall in and uh, when I see like really strong women who head up uh, Facebook or Google or um, some of these big companies I just admire um, the fact that they're where they are because it, it took a lot more subtlety and uh, and challenges to overcome to get there so to me being a female entrepreneur um, is has its challenges, but I think the more you call out the challenges of being a female entrepreneur, the more you set um, s you set yourself back. I think preaching about things uh, will, it, it just puts people's backs up and makes people defensive and divides them. So my whole philosophy about being a female entrepreneur and also being a female gamer is don't call it out. Just see how you want to live and how you would ideally um, what your end game is and just aim for it and yes there might be more obstacles than other people but everybody will have their obstacles and uh, the more that women just um, decide where they want to be and just go there and overcome what they need hurdle by hurdle that will pave the way for more women to just be 
be who they want to be and not even have to call out the fact that there's any differences between them or male entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, to me, preaching is ineffective. Um, leading by example is the only way you change minds. You've mentioned a couple of times the desire when signing the deal to hold on to the intellectual property. Um, it seems to be a recent trend that you know keeping the IP is very important to creators. Um, is that a transmedia thing, or like what? What do you think is important about that, and how do you utilize IP? I think it's very important to retain your IP. I think that um, uh, I mean that was definitely something that drove me every step of the way because um, the creator forms the kernel of the idea. Yes, uh, you know you know, dozens or hundreds of other people come to contribute and create that vision. But without that creator, you have nothing. And I think that that's what sort of drove my resentment of the traditional system is that um, people's ideas and creativity and personality were being disposed of to make something, you know, more uh, mediocre and vanilla and uh, rounding the quarters out. And that's what I don't enjoy uh, about the traditional traditional system that has evolved in storytelling in uh, TV and movies. So um, that was something that was so po important to me um, because on it, it, it came down to like I'm bringing these things to the table and the budgets were so low and yet your traditional model says you take my thing away from me and, and I don't get input anymore. The freedom of the internet gave me the the reason and the tools to say no to that and um, yeah we're, we're working we're living in a time where people can invent who they are and invent business models and invent storytelling in a new way why should they give that up to somebody who's just a distributor when in fact middlemen are kind of going the way of the dinosaurs in a sense um, so uh, yeah I'm very proud of that fact that I retain the IP and not everything you can retain um, I just did Dragon Age, which obviously was their IP, but I was able to go in their world and do something that nobody has done before, take a video game and, uh, and put it in a web series format that, uh, that um, you know, I think will be, you know, really well received. Uh, so that was something I wanted to do to expand myself. So it's not like 100% or nothing, but um, selectively, especially if you create something from the ground up and you have the opportunity, you should go as far with your IP as possible because that will give you more power and uh, you'll be more invested in it and it'll make your product more valuable at the end. Um, and ju just to <clears throat> clarify the point, owning the IP enables you to control the future of that story, or is it more important to control being able to utilize the IP in other media? Retaining the IP does several things. It allows you to retain creative control of the direction of your characters and your story from a storytelling aspect. It uh, allows you to retain some control with the distribution so that if you have ideas you can have the flexibility to um, work together collaboratively with you know your producer to figure out where um, to distribute that um, and that sort of ancillary uh, revenue down the line and uh, it also if that IP becomes something that you want to exploit in other means which I think is very important to the future of the internet like it's not just video it could be a comic book or it could be a, uh, a game it could be a, a, a movie at the same time as it's a web show so um, that sort of three-dimensional storytelling is the future and to give it up to somebody is just to give them the tools to exploit it in ways that you might not feel comfortable and could shut you out so um, you know the, the, the tools are there I mean, we've just been two women doing everything. The tools are there to retain what you create. You should retain it as long as possible until you realize, I can't do it better than this person. This is a person I want to bring in. Not just because that's the traditional model, just to sell. And was it important to sign with a non-traditional network like Microsoft? I know you said this already, but you can just clarify that. It was very important to me to find the right partner who would be able to take our audience and increase it. And on the internet, the traditional uh, networks don't have that. They don't have better traffic sites than, say, Microsoft or other big tech companies. They don't have the portals that people go to because that's not been their business model. So it was very, very important to me to find somebody who would give us more audience, not less. And that's, um, that was the direction that going to the more traditional uh, studio model would have taken us to. And I saw that happen to other people's shows. And I said, this isn't going to happen with the show. I'd rather just shoot it again on my own, you know, on my own money and release it uh, on YouTube than do that. Um, can you speak a little bit about the geek culture community and, and you feel supported by it? 
I feel so blessed and um, loved by the whole geek community. And um, to me, I've always been an outsider. I was always raised um, outside the mainstream and always felt like I was looking into other people. <laughs> and the fact that I, um, I, I can say that hopefully I've opened the door to, for more people to be feel accepted and feel loved and also feel um, comfortable to be themselves no matter what it is that they um, feel passionate about or who they love or who, what they believe in. Uh, to me, that is a gift that we have nowadays with the internet that it's opened up doors for people. And, um, you know, the Guild, had there only been a thousand people who were entertained by it, um, I would have still felt as fulfilled and um, excited and um, rewarded as if, you know, we have a hundred million people watching the show, which we do now. Because I'm creating, I'm expressing myself in a way that's unique to me, and I found people who are interested in it, and that's, we're living in a wonderful time where people can do that. They can find their audience with no barriers and no sort of financial um, barrier, really. I mean, there are some, but it's so much lower than any time in history uh, to create things, art, video, uh, writing. So, um, and, and, and that's what's uh, my proudest thing that I do is that if somebody says they started painting again or played the violin again because of what I've, I've done, um, yeah, I mean, that definitely is the most flattering thing. So how did the rise of geek culture sort of dominating the mainstream um, affect the guild and, and how it grew? The, yeah, the, the sort of mainstreaming of geek culture definitely, I think, has started a little before the guild, but, um, you know, with all the comic book movies, definitely it's, you know, taken off. And I think that's kind of uh, tangential to the adaptations of comic books and other properties into mainstream movies and the power of social media Absolutely, because social media um, drives the internet, it drives people's interests, and the people who are on the internet, the early adopters, the people who were, you know, posting pictures 10 years ago on the internet, those were geeks. They were people who love comic books, they, they love movies, they love, um, you know, science fiction. Those are really motivated, hardcore communities who found each other online, and the infrastructure was there. Uh, between them. So I think that um, definitely smart people, marketers and advertisers um, saw that and, and, you know, jumped on the bandwagon. Um, you know, a lot of people are like resentful of that. But um, to me, you know, geekdom is just whatever you love. So if you're a golf geek, you're just as legitimately a geek as anybody and you can find a community online. And um, that's why I think the guild has been successful that you know, we weren't afraid to aim toward a niche of geeks, of gaming geeks. I wasn't, you know, I didn't try to just make it more general to be able to please everyone like a traditional TV show would. And I think that's because, that's why we're successful, because we were able to identify our audience and the millions of channels that are on the internet and uh, and get our get word out. And then we grow, uh, grew out from there versus, um, you know, trying to just aim toward everybody and hoping that it would stick. It never would work on the internet. And I think that's the challenge. Um, but also the blessing for independent creators. So the number one greatest obstacle that you faced, was that when you had it as a, as a TV script and then that wasn't going to work, or was it something in the production? Like, when, what was the toughest the, the number one toughest moment within the show was um, the summer between episodes one. I mean, the number one toughest thing that we experienced during the show, I think, was probably... Um, between seasons one and seasons two about the decision on who to sell to or to sell the whole IP or just sell you know the licensing or do it on our own and that those were very hard times I, I would look at contracts that were ready to sign and it would almost sign and I just didn't feel right about it because I knew that we could do more than these fancy people um, on our own and why were we giving away our show just because they had a reputation in mainstream it there was just when I thought about it there was no correlation to our further success with somebody from a TV world. There just wasn't, because we'd been doing it better, you know, as good or better than anybody else on the web by ourselves, two people, you know, behind their computers. So there was no incentive, and we had the power to go back to our audience to, to release it. Um, and I know that other people would probably have sold because the relationship they would have garnered and maybe the, the idea that they would get into more TV and film and, and take that and build, that wasn't my goal. Um, and that would be a lot of other people's goals, but it wasn't mine. So, uh, but just turning those down was, uh, it was quite, it was, it was pretty nerve wracking. <laughs> um, when you say that wasn't your goal, can you say specifically what your goal was? 
I mean, I, I would say that uh, getting back into mainstream TV and movies as a creator or an actress was my goal when I very first started writing a script and a part for myself. But as I uh, experienced the uh, amazing um, interaction with fans in an immediate way, and um, and I delved into the social media aspect of it, where I'm really interacting with thousands of people a day and, and spreading word about my show and just being able to be so hands-on with the people who enjoy what I do and so immediate like I didn't really see the point of uh, of trying to go in into this other world like this was a world I wanted to stay in and develop even if it was something that was not necessarily supporting me a hundred percent I was able to act at the same time to get me through um, in order to just keep doing something that I love because I would wake up every morning excited to do what I do on the internet and I think that that if you could find something like that in your life that you don't even consider work and you would do for free anyway um, you know you're on the right path and then eventually it will take you somewhere and if it doesn't at least you'll be happy between those start and that finish uh, if you could go back to yourself when you were looking at those contracts and didn't know what to do what would be one piece of advice you'd give yourself if I could go back and give myself advice um, I would definitely say um, I mean, I feel like we've done a lot of things right. <laughs> I would say definitely um, the idea that delegation would be a little bit better because we probably would have put out episodes a little bit faster. And then, um, you know, some advice to myself as a writer because I wasn't an easy writer. And it's just now with this last, you know, last six months that I've been able to write without agony. And, uh, and I look back and I think, wow, you really beat yourself up for a lot of not great reasons. And... Uh, you have to be kind to your inner creator. That's what I probably would say.